Flashback. Basically, they just copy paste her Wikipedia and maybe watch her behind the music episode. Something I can do with more justice and effort than they did. That was what I said on my review of Aaliyah's horrible Lifetime movie and I think it's time to fulfill my commitment. Today I'm going to tell the story of Aaliyah to the best of my abilities and this is one of the saddest stories I've ever done on this channel. So without further ado, this is the story of Aaliyah. May she rest in peace. Before we begin, if you want to see music bios or more good videos like this, hit the subscribe button. Also I've started a Patreon account. On here you get more copyrighted material and they'll be uploaded 48 hours prior to YouTube. If you want to support or visit, link is in the description. And without further ado, on to our feature presentation. Aaliyah Dana Houghton was born on January 16th, 1979 in New York but later moved to Detroit. At an early age, she found a love for music, not only from her parents, but from her aunt Gladys Knight. She would travel with her aunt to get a glimpse of the entertainment business. She made her first television appearance at the age of 10 on Star Search performing My Funny Valentine, which she didn't win. Devastated but not deterred, her auntie Gladys had her sing at her residency in Las Vegas over her summer as she entered her teen years, she attended Detroit High School for the Fine Arts. It was said that she had to sing Ave Maria in Italian to get accepted. Her uncle Barry Hankerson started his own label, Black Ground Records, and he signed Aaliyah. The label would later get distribution from Jive as she would start to work on her debut album at the age of 14. To help with her debut, she would be mentored by Robert who was coming off of his success of his album, 12 Play. He wrote and produced every song for her debut except for one. He also gave her the image of her signature sunglasses. That debut album will be called Age Ain't Nothing But A Number, released in May 1994 when she was only 15. And that peaked at number 5 on the Billboard Hot 100 and number 1 on the R&B charts. Other songs included At Your Best, which was originally recorded by the Isley Brothers, the only song Robert wasn't credited in, going number 6 on the Hot 100 and the title track as Age Ain't Nothing But A Number went platinum. But rumors began to surface that she and Robert's relationship was closer than you think. In 1994, Robert allegedly filed a marriage license for Aaliyah to sign. She does and lies on the certificate saying she was 18, when in reality, she was underage. When Abide Magazine aired out the marriage by showing the marriage license, her parents weren't having it. So on February 1995, her parents filed for an annulment. Her father took it a step further barring Robert from working with Aaliyah ever again. Back in 1997, Aaliyah finished high school maintaining a 4.0 GPA. Once she finished high school, she wanted some changes for her next album. For one, Black Brown left Jive for Atlantic. Second, Atlantic wanted Aaliyah to work with some of the biggest names in the industry. However, she recruited two unknowns to control most of the album. And those names were Timberland and Missy Elliott, who were once part of Devante Swing's Swing Mob Collective. Another image change occurred, you know, her signature hair of the eye thing. In August 1996, One in a Million was released. Songs included If Your Girl Only Knew, One in a Million, Four Page Letter, The One I Gave My Heart To, which was written by Diane Warren, and Hot Like Fire as One in a Million went double platinum. Fashion will be the next take on her career. In 1997, she became the spokesperson of Tommy Hilfiger, but Hollywood wouldn't be too far. She got her first acting gig playing herself on New York Undercover. Then she got the opportunity to record a song for the Anastasia movie called Journey to the Past. Not a chart success, but the song, which was written by Lynn Arenz and Stephen Flattery, was nominated for Best Original Song at the Oscars. Because of this, she nervously performed the song, and at the age of 19, she became the youngest artist to perform on the Oscar stage. She got another opportunity to record a song for the Doolittle soundtrack called Are You That Somebody. The song peaked at number 21 on the Hot 100, and that song was nominated for Best Female R&B Vocal Performance at the Grammys. In 1999, Aaliyah got her dream job. She scored the leading role in a film called Romeo Must Die. Other actors in that movie included Jet Li, DMX, Isaiah Washington, Anthony Anderson, among others. 
The next year, the film hit theaters to mixed reviews despite critics praising Aaliyah's performance. For the soundtrack, she was the executive producer and recorded four songs for the soundtrack. One of those songs was Try Again. And that song peaked at number one on the Billboard Hot 100. She was nominated for another Grammy and she won Best Female Video at the 2000 MTV VMAs. Aaliyah's love life was also beginning to take place as she started a relationship with Rockefeller CEO Damon Dash. In 2000, Aaliyah landed a second film role on the movie Queen of the Damned. According to Aaliyah, she described her character as manipulative, crazy, sexual being. But at the same time, she started working on her third album. And even though her schedule conflicted, she was able to work on a film during the day and record the album at night. Black Brown also signed another distribution deal with Virgin. With this album, she worked with Static Major as her primary writer for the album. Her third album, Aaliyah, was released in July 2001. Even though the album debuted at number 2 on the Billboard 200 with 187,000 copies first week, which are both highs, her lead single underperformed. We Need a Resolution peaked at number 59 on the Hot 100, but not to worry, she was able to lock down a performance at the 2001 VMAs to showcase this song. The label decided to work another single for the album. In early August, she filmed the video for More Than a Woman, but the label instead started to ship Rock the Boat to radio as that song was responding well with fans. She discussed this on an appearance on BET's 106 and Park, where she also gave away an Escalade to a lucky fan. And it should also be noted, around this time, Aaliyah agreed to do a remake of Sparkle with Whitney Houston. August 22nd, Aaliyah travels to Miami to start filming on Rock the Boat. And BET is also there to showcase the process of on their show, Access Granted. The video was directed by Hype Williams and the choreography was done by Fatima Robinson. And here's a fun fact, future Pussycat Doll member Karmit Bashar was one of the dancers in the video. Barry Hankerson, who was Aaliyah's uncle and head of Black Ground, did not want Hype Williams to direct the video due to his affiliation with Robert, but it'll be Aaliyah's mother who begged for Hype to do it. The next day, after shooting gets done in Miami, everyone flew to the Bahamas to work on the video some more. On August 25th, Aaliyah wrapped her scenes, but Hype Williams still had everyone else working on the video. Aaliyah and everyone else was supposed to leave the next day, but since she got done earlier than expected, she wanted to fly out back to Miami earlier. And it should be noted that Aaliyah was a nervous flyer and was given a sedative to relax her. The flight was supposed to take off at 4.30 p.m., but the plane didn't arrive on the runway until 6.15 p.m. After some engine starting trouble, the plane took off sometime around 6.30. Less than five minutes after takeoff, the plane crashed 200 feet from the runway. No one survived the crash. The victims included pilot Luis Morales III, Chris Maldonado, Douglas Kratz, Gina Smith, her hairstylist, Keith Wallace, Eric Foreman, Anthony Dodd, Scott Gallen, it was said that he survived the initial crash but died some time later. And lastly, Aaliyah Dana Houghton. According to her autopsy, she died from a severe shock, a weak heart, and a blow to the head with severe burns. And had she survived the crash, recovery would have been impossible. She was only 22. Over the next days and weeks, the world went into mourning. On August 31st, Aaliyah's funeral took place. Mourners included Monica, P. Diddy, Missy Elliott, Timberland, Jay-Z, among so many others. After the funeral, 22 doves were released into the air in homage to every year of her life. A week after her death, her album jumped from 19 to number 1 on the Billboard 200. More Than a Woman charted at number 25 on the Hot 100, but it reached number 1 in the UK as she overtook another posthumous song in My Sweet Lord by George Harrison. As for Rock the Boat, there were concerns about the video being released given her untimely death, but it was released on October through BET's Access Granted. Once it premiered on MTV, it became the fourth most premiered video on the network ever. Billboard placed this video on the top 100 best music videos of the 21st century. Oh, and the song peaked at number 14 on the Hot 100 as her self-titled third album went triple platinum, her highest selling album to date. Now let's circle back to the crash. There were concerns about the plane as it was different from the plane that they arrived in. Passengers then got into an argument with Morales as he tried to convince that the plane was overloaded, but the passengers overruled and took off. And after intense investigations, 
Officials ruled that the cause of crash was that the plane was overloaded by at least 700 pounds. They also ruled that the pilot, Luis Morales, was ineligible to fly the plane in the first place. Two weeks prior to the crash, he was arrested for cocaine possession and was sentenced to probation. Two days before the crash, he was hired by Black Hawk International Airways and that company had a history of not drug testing their pilots or workers. Morales also lied about the number of hours flight to get the job. In his autopsy, doctors found traces of cocaine and alcohol in his system. To answer the question on what caused the crash, inexperienced and uncertified pilot and the plane being overloaded. Families of the deceased, including Elias, filed wrongful death suits against Black Hawk but was settled out of court. Then they took their frustrations at Virgin Records, believing that they were liable in all who perished since they covered most of the video cost. Some of the family suits stated that Virgin refused to cover their funeral expenses, saying they put profits over people. Sources differ on what and how Virgin made the settlements. Let's just say they kept things behind closed doors. In 2002, Queen of the Damned was released. It was said that her brother Rashad redubbed some of her lines during post-production. Just like with Romeo Must Die, the film was met with negative reviews despite a good performance from Aaliyah. Also, a survey was done about newborn babies and Aaliyah was one of the most used names of 2002. Later that year, a compilation project called Care For You was posthumously released. It had one new single called Miss You which highlights a romance broken from her college-bound lover, but after her death, it posed a different meaning. Fun fact, Genuine, who wrote the song, was going to keep the song for himself, but after Aaliyah recorded it back in 99, he gave it to her, but Black Brown kept it off her third album as they felt like it wasn't a smash. But after death, it was a smash. It peaked at number 3 on the Hot 100, number 1 on the R&B charts, and number 8 on the 2003 year-end list. The song was also later remixed by Jay-Z. The album went platinum with a portion of the earnings going to Aaliyah Memorial Fund, a program that benefits the Revlon UCLA Women's Cancer Research Program and Harlem Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. In the era of streaming, her music has been influenced or sampled by some of the biggest artists today like Normani on her Wild Side video and especially Drake have been doing their part on keeping Aaliyah's legacy alive. But during the 2010s, her legacy was jeopardized. First, in 2014, Lifetime produced a movie called Aaliyah, The Princess of R&B. Produced by Wendy Williams, the film was met with a ton of backlash. First, her family strongly disapproved of the movie and refused to let any of her music to be used in her film, with very few exceptions. Then Zendaya was supposed to play the lead, but gladly pulled out due to the backlash. It was a mess that was already expressed in another video. During this time, Barry Hankerson refused to release his acts into streaming services, that also included Tank. Fun fact, he started his career singing background for Aaliyah. The early works from Timberland and Magoo, Recipes to Magoo, he actually passed away recently, JoJo, Ashley from Old Town, and the Romeo Must Die soundtrack. The only album that was available for streaming was her debut. But all that changed in 2021 when Hankerson founded Blackground 2.0 and signed a distribution deal through Empire Distribution. With this deal, Aaliyah and other past Black Brown artists will have their works available to streaming. Almost 20 years after her death, One in a Million was re-released to streaming and thanks to that, the album reached a new peak at number 9 on the Billboard 200. Romeo Must Die soundtrack in Aaliyah 2001 followed shortly after. Barry Hankerson also announced a posthumous Aaliyah album was in the works but as of 2024 and haven't been released yet. As for Aaliyah, her time on the earth was short and even though her legacy was jeopardized on a few occasions, she is still looked upon as one of the most influential R&B artists of our time. And that concludes the story of Aaliyah. Tell me what y'all think in the comments below. Please like, comment, and subscribe to the channel. Thanks for watching. Once again, rest in peace to Aaliyah. And I'll see you next time. You're a bit sad. The the good moments when you're on stage performing in front of thousands of people. In the end, it's all worth it.